Hi everyone, I wanted to hop on here and show you ways to practice watercolor if you're not quite sure what subject matter to pick, or if you just want to paint for the day without thinking too hard about your subject matter. For example, today I will be painting the Notre Dame Cathedral with a design that I found on Pixabay. And this is great for me while I'm recovering from an elbow injury. I can use a pre-made line art drawing that I can then build upon. And some of these are available for purchase, others are free, so you can choose what kind of subject matter you like. But for me, you know, I have several different paintings in progress and lately, especially this past week with the weather change, my elbow injury has just been awful. I have had a really difficult time drawing or painting and even holding my brush like this without having to take long breaks. So if you're like me and you're dealing with that kind of hindrance at the moment, or if you know you have time constraints, time is never on our side. And this is just a really fun way to practice. So today I'm going to show you how to use masking fluid to block out your highlights and lightest areas of your painting. And you can follow along with this exact design. I'll have the link to the design in my description. Or you can pick a different subject matter and still follow some of those same techniques. So we'll use masking fluid, we'll use some lifting techniques, we'll do a simple color scheme, and hopefully you enjoy the process. I'm gonna go ahead and set up my supplies and I'll be right back. Before I start discussing masking fluid, I just wanted to quickly thank you for your support, all the lovely comments that I received on my videos. I have a small channel, but it seems to be growing and that's just really exciting. So I have several videos in the works that people have either requested or that I planned on rolling out. I'm just a little behind, as I said, last week was not so good, but hopefully those upcoming videos are helpful to you and I'd love to hear more about what you'd like to see on the channel. So with this design, I am really trying to focus heavily on highlights and this is a really important part of any painting that you do with watercolor or gouache. Typically with watercolor, we have the white of the paper to be our lightest and brightest highlight. So I always like to incorporate the brightness of our border and the white of our paper somewhere else in our design. It just makes things more cohesive and it just makes your colors glow. So it's a very difficult thing to practice with as a beginner and masking fluid will be your friend. <laughs> so there are different types of masking fluids that you can use. A standard masking fluid is just basically liquid latex. You can get this from Windsor and Newton or other similar brands. And it usually comes in a bottle that you use a brush or another tool to paint directly on your paper before you ever start painting with your pigments. So people sometimes like to use toothpicks to do this. That way you can get some of those fine little lines with it. I do not like using good brushes for this because you will absolutely destroy them with the liquid latex. It doesn't matter if you clean them well. In the long run, you will not have a good brush. So you can use old brushes for this that can create some wonderful textures, especially if you're doing natural landscapes. Or I like to use these silicone shapers in different shapes. And even the largest shape here is great if I have to block out large parts of my painting. So you can also use just regular masking tape if you can control that and cut that, like my birch tree design that I showed you. But these personally are great because I can also use them in my book binding classes where I can just remove the latex with just a little bit of pressure. And I can use them at different angles. So for example, these tiny little lines for my columns here, I can just stamp so I'm not feeling like I have to painstakingly draw every little design in. And another thing I like to use is a masking marker, something like this by Goya. And this is wonderful because you can really just draw with it like a regular pen or marker. And it is great at getting those really tiny designs, especially for one like this, where I am putting quite a bit of effort into blocking out areas of the architecture that I want to protect. So for example, this whole area right here where you have all of these sculptures, these freestanding sculptures in here, 
I want to make sure I have a nice shadow around them to block those out. And in my original design, I was able to do that where I can paint all around them, lift up that masking fluid, and then I can do a little glaze over it. So I don't have the original painting of this anymore, but I gave it to a friend because they liked it and they had just been to Paris. So it was a nice little gift for them, but I do have this little <laughs> rough copy of it from my last uh, thing that I did. I don't know what I'm trying to say right now. <laughs> Another thing that I'll zoom out and show you that's great for masking fluid is you know you wanna apply this first to your design. You wanna let it completely dry before you ever start painting. But after you're finished painting, you need to remove it. So ways to remove that are, you can just use your fingers, but some people don't like doing that because your hands can get oily and apply that to your paper and you know make a mess out of that. If you're like me and you don't wanna add that to your paper, cause I have uh, issues with perfectionism, you can use just a putty eraser. These are great for charcoal drawing. You can stretch them out and use them to lift up your latex or your liquid masking fluid or frisk. And then you can add in those last little details. There's also this rubber little square you can get. This is usually for rubber cement, but it works great for liquid latex too. And this after, again, your painting is completely dried, after you added all of your other details, you can just gently pull up that liquid latex after everything is dry. So I'll show you some other methods to apply that today and then we'll start painting. Now I stated earlier that I found this design on Pixabay. You can find other similar things on Shutterstock and other similar sites. And I always tell people to make sure that you understand what the artist's permissions are and their copyright permissions because they are radically different from each artist. So for this particular artist, I paid some credits on the site to receive um, a copy of their file that didn't have watermarks on it. I know when you're looking closely at some of their permissions, some of them only want you to use them for personal reasons or personal work, and then others you can use for business. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're searching for subject matter. And even if you're not using somebody else's art, you can use the same technique with your own designs. So if you have a drawing that you worked on heavily, I say to either scan it or take a photo of it. You can always print out another copy of it if, to practice with before you do your final design. This is what many artists do with watercolor because there is a, you know, time that is incorporated with each draft of your design that you do. And many times I'll even just do a Xerox copy on regular paper if I need to just do a quick mock-up of my colors. And that usually gives me enough information on how I want to tackle my color scheme for this design. So you have not seen all of the background work that I did for this one, but I came up with a simple color palette that I think works for this cathedral. But you know, these are always good things to keep in the back of your mind with your own art, to save on time, and to prevent you from getting too frustrated because some of these things just don't translate out of our minds onto our materials. Now I wanna just quickly zoom in on the masking fluid to show you the ways that they apply and how they can radically um, change <laughs> as you work with different materials. So I used this pen for most of mine, just because this was quite detailed with these thin lines. However, if you're using a brush or a silicone shaper, sometimes when you apply that on there, it gets a little bit goopier. The only thing you need to worry about is if it's bubbling too much. Sometimes if it goes outside of these lines, if you have them, it's no problem, we can clean that up after we remove the masking fluid. But typically what you wanna do is just do a thin layer. You don't need a lot to cover the white of the paper. And again, you just wanna make sure that it is completely dry before you start working with your paint. Because if you are moving it around while it's still wet, some of that sometimes gets embedded in the fibers of the paper or it's difficult to see where it is on there. So I like to use one that's colored with a different color like blue, 
or you can get the white or clear masking fluid. This one just makes it a little bit easier for me to see. However, it can be challenging because then you have this bright blue that's competing with your colors. So just keep that in the back of your head. After you remove them, your painting might look drastically different, but it doesn't mean that your painting is done, right? So you have plenty of opportunities to tweak the design, add in details, and get your painting to where you want it to be. I forgot to mention this, but uh, this is pretty important to think about when you're setting up your design for printing. And it doesn't matter if you're using somebody else's line art or your own. You want to think about the opacity of the lines. So I'm going to zoom in on this and show you what I mean. So you can see here where I changed the opacity for my file, where my lines are more of this gray value. And that will keep it from looking too harsh when I am painting. I want more of this like loose, glowy style today. But if you are more interested in more of like a technical painting or like a pen and ink wash, you can make these lines as dark as you want. The only thing that you need to be concerned with is whether or not those lines will reactivate when they hit um, water with your paintbrush. So if you are using these really light lines, you can get away with running it on an inkjet printer using just regular watercolor paper. If you want those dark lines, you'll want to run it through a laser printer to keep that from spreading and turning into a big mess. Another thing to make sure that you do is you want to adhere your paper to something sturdy and just use some regular masking tape or whatever you have on hand to do this. We're going to be using a lot of washes where our paper wants to expand and as it dries it's going to contract too. So if you're a beginner, I suggest working in an eight by 10 or A4 size sheet of paper. That's gonna give you some wiggle room to do these washes and get some of these details in. But you know, if you feel like you're up to the challenge, you can always work larger. This is one where it's probably better to work around this size or larger than trying to work smaller, unless you feel very confident with smaller paintbrushes. I will leave that up to you since you are your own artist. All right, we are ready to start mixing our paints and I'll just quickly go over what I'm using today. I'm using some cadmium yellow that I'll dilute quite a bit to create some of these golden colors and yellows that are kind of glowing around the cathedral. Since this is a spiritual place, I thought it would be fun to play with these different types of glazes to create the illusion of light. And I also have some alizarin crimson that we'll use to add some violets and red violets in areas. Some burnt sienna, which is also going to be used for shadows and other areas to create that aged look of the cathedral. Some ultramarine blue and some possibly some golden ochre here that I had in the studio. If you don't have this color, don't worry. I know that ochres tend to be more opaque colors, so this may not work. But um, I'll just show you if it does work, then you have that option. <laughs> You'll also want a large wash brush or a flat brush since we're going to be using this wet and wet technique where we are going to wet our paper first. And if you have a brush this size or larger, that will work. You may also want one a little bit smaller if you need to go around the edges of the cathedral. And I always like to keep a variety of round brushes on hand. These are my standards. I have a size 0, 6, and 12. So those are helpful. And then I always like to use my rigor brush here, which is like this long spindly brush that I use if I need to create these thin lines for these columns in the architecture. So we'll see how that all plays out today. Use what you have in your studio or in your collection and I'm sure it'll be fine. Now this is quite an easy mix today because we're mostly just working with diluted colors from the tubes of watercolor paint. If you have a pan set, you may just wanna add a little bit more pigment to your washes as needed, especially if you're using them throughout your painting. So I'm just gonna dip my brush in some clean water and I'm going to take a scoop of my alizarin crimson. Oops, it's sat and dried a little bit. And I don't need a ton of this, but since this is a larger painting, I'm gonna just take a little bit of it. Clean my brush. And then I'm gonna take two scoops of ultramarine blue. So I'm gonna just put these in these two wells here. Okay. 
I always like re-record so often to try and get it just right when I'm talking that these sometimes start to dry up on me, but it's fine because they can just get reactivated with some water, thankfully. So I'm just scooping that into two wells, getting enough of it so I have a good amount of mixture. I can always mix more of this as I need to. Try and press off any of that on the side of the well to get rid of any of that blue in there so I don't waste it. And then I'll clean my brush. And this is where we are going to use a little bit of this alizarin crimson to mix in with here. So we're gonna create a violet color. And I like to have just a scrap piece of watercolor paper on hand to do a little swatch to see what my color actually looks like. So this is a nice violet color. If I want to, I can make it a little bit more of a red violet. Oops, a little bit more. You can see that's great for adding some of those other details in the design. Now, if I want more of a blue violet, I can just add a little bit more of my ultramarine. And that'll create a nice blue violet right there. Now for some of these, if we wanna get those really dark colors, what we'll do is we're gonna do the same thing in this little well right here. We'll add some of our alizarin and crimson and just press that in on the side. And then I'm also going to add a little bit of my burnt sienna. A little bit more ultramarine blue. And this is going to create more of a grayish violet, which will be great if we're trying to do more of these detailed paintings. You can always mix your ultramarine blue with a little bit of your burnt sienna. Since they're close to being complementary colors, since this is such an orange color, they will create a brown. A grayish brown. So that's nice if you want to create like a Payne's gray color. You can always add a little bit more of burnt sienna to it. And that's great if you want to add some really dark marks to it. And that's mostly what we're mixing today. Everything else we're just going to dilute directly and add it to the painting. But you can see throughout the original design, I'll just zoom in on it really quick. There's many different shades of this violet and blue color. So if you want, you can always add a little bit more water to your mixture to create a lighter value. And that's where you get these really subtle changes of color throughout your piece. I'll show you a few other tricks to that so things don't get too heavy with your design, but we are ready to go. Now, if your water is getting a little bit murky, what you can do is go ahead and get some clean water for this next step. And what we're gonna do is focus just around the outside edges of our cathedral. We're mostly gonna focus on the upper half of it to create these beautiful clouds in the sky. And we're not trying to put a lot of detail into this. We just want the upper half of it to be a little bit darker. And then we'll go ahead and add some little yellows and possibly some violets around the edges. So this should go pretty fast for you. You already have a blue violet mixed up, but if you wanna change that up a little bit, you can. So if you want more of a stormy sky, what you can do is add a little bit of yellow to your mixture. I'm gonna add a little bit more blue to mine. See how this looks. That's pretty close to the original color where it has a little pop of violet in it. But if you feel like that's too strong, if you add a tiny bit of yellow, just mix that up on the side right here, that will create more of a gray sky. It's not a whole 
big change. Let me do this a little bit more dramatic so you can see it on screen. <laughs> there we go. A little bit more of a gray tone to it. So you decide how you want this to look. If you want it really dramatic, you can make it stormy. Or if you want it really bright, you can use more of a blue-violet. Next, we're going to take our fluffy brush, whichever one we have. This one I have just comes to a point, like a cat's tongue, just to get around some of these edges. But I'm just going to quickly dip my brush in my water and apply it anywhere where I want that color to go. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect. We just want to have some control over where this wet and wet look for our sky is going. And I have to do this a little bit looser just because my arm is in a lot of pain today. Probably shouldn't be painting right now, but I have more good days than bad days anymore. So I'm just trying to work through it and give you a good tutorial. So I'm going to just work that around all the way to this bottom half right here. And like I said, if some of it overlaps, it's no big deal. You just want to make sure there's not any large puddles of paint that are going to be difficult to dry. Okay, and when I'm ready, I'm going to dip my brush in that blue pigment that we had, and I'm just going to apply it to this upper half first. I'm leaving some spaces between it. So you can see I'm just barely adding it to parts of the design. Let me show you this at a, a different angle because I feel like you're not seeing it very well. So since it's a wash, it's going to move wherever that water is. So I'm just leaving some gaps and spaces and that's going to help create those clouds. So this is just that blue color. If I want it to be a little bit more dramatic, I can add a little bit more ultramarine blue in spots. You need to work pretty quickly for this part just to make sure that it doesn't dry too fast on you. Add just a little bit of this towards the bottom too. Just in a few spots to create an easy shadow right there where that is. And at this point some of your your painting might start to dry a little bit around the edges. So I can always pull this color down a little bit with just some clean water. You can also tilt your painting if you'd like. Let gravity do its thing. And then next I'm going to take some of my yellow and just dilute it with a little bit of water. And I can drop that into a few spots just to Brighten this up a little bit. I'm trying to avoid some of the blue so I don't create a green. But if you do, it's no big deal. And I'm just using this sparingly just to brighten up that sky a little bit. If you want, you can even do the same thing with your alizarin. You're just going to want to dilute that with quite a bit of water. I'm just using this side of my palette right here. And I can drop that in near the bottom half or near the yellow. There's a lot right here, so I'm going to scoop some of that up. And I don't mind if some of this goes into parts of the cathedral. At this point, our sky up here isn't really moving a lot, so we can start pulling some of these colors into the center of our design. And that's what's gonna be the fun part of this painting is you're just going to really loosen up with your style. If you have like a, a more like technical painting style or if you're like me and you really like details, this is one of those where you can still get a lot of details, but first we're doing all this like loose color. 
So if you want, you can add a little bit more yellow in some spots, again, that very diluted yellow. We're just dropping that into a few areas. So this is gonna slowly turn the center part of our painting into more of a wet and wet technique. And I like to have fun where any of the windows are or anywhere where I know light is gonna be really reflecting. And since we've already blocked out the highlights of our painting, we can have fun with using wet and wet anywhere else. So I'm going to add a little bit of my burnt sienna where I'm just diluting some of that. And you can switch brushes if you need to. If this fluffy brush is a little too hard for you, can you switch to your large round right here? And for the burnt sienna, I'm going to focus this in a few more places, usually where a portal is. Anywhere where I want a little bit of a shadow. And you can see it's very diluted. It's creating a nice rusty color. Because if you add too much, it's gonna be like an orange cathedral. And that's fine too. I mean, there's a lot of color to the Notre Dame Cathedral. You can add a little bit of this color towards the bottom half too, if you wanna create some subtlety in the shadows where that is. Go a little bit darker with the burnt sienna in just a few spots. And this is just the base of our painting. So we don't wanna to go too dark in areas because we're gonna do a lot of glazing. So this is just to get the overall colors down. And then I'm just gonna take some of my blue violet anywhere where I want some of these darker shadows. You can see in my original one here, I have a few on this section here and through some of the windows, especially right here. So I'm gonna go with that darker blue violet. You can also use your red violet if you'd like. And I'm just gonna do a little stripe of that across part of it. And it's much easier to use violets to create shadows just because it doesn't feel like it's dulling your painting. If you use just solid black or something like that, it, it just doesn't give a lot to the painting. It, it can really make all of your other colors just look a little less precise, a little less vibrant. So I'm just mixing these in a few spots, letting them mix together to create their own little shadow. Most of the shadows we're gonna do heavier on the next step. And if for some reason you don't like how that's looking, you can go ahead and just clean your brush really well and pull up that color and just wipe that color off on a paper towel. You can always dap it up too. That was a little too dark for me for that first step. You can also go around any edges where you feel like you need to pull up that color. And I'm gonna add a little bit of dark color in here with that blue violet again. You can see how fast this is going for this step. Don't be so concerned about making it perfect. It's part of the beauty of watercolor where it can just emphasize just a little bit of what you're seeing. And see here I added just a little bit of shadow around the portals here that lead out. 
And I'll make that even darker later. There's a lot of fun that you can have with this where you can make it almost look like stained glass. And that's really why I like just practicing with some of these pre-made designs is that if it fails, then you can always just do another one or you learned from what you needed to and then you can move on. Okay, so I'm gonna let that sit and dry and I will be right back to show you the next layer. So we now have our paintings completely dry, either using a hair dryer or just letting it dry naturally. And you can see how the blue of the, <laughs> the masking fluid can somehow make it a little bit difficult to see what we're working with. You can see, especially right here, that is quite distracting. So you have to pretend that this is white, like the white of your paper. And eventually we'll glaze over that so it doesn't look harsh. But you can see how all the watercolor just dried in some really interesting ways. And let me zoom on this a little bit more to show you what you can do with this next step. So we definitely need to add more contrast in spaces so we get the understanding that these are columns that are in the front and then there's some darkness and shadow behind it, especially right here where we have all of these figures. And so that's something important that we'll do next with some darker blues and violets. But this is where you can look closely at how yours dried and maybe you wanna keep some of this. Maybe that's exactly what you were looking for. And especially with the painting like this where all of it is about this architecture, which is also a spiritual place. So much of the architecture is based on how light is reflected on the inside because spirituality is such a difficult thing to explain in itself. So color and the use of color and shadow can really emphasize what you're trying to paint. And it's just a really fun exercise. It doesn't even have to be architecture, but the way that these glazes dry, it just makes me happy because it's always that surprise. And down here, we're especially going to add in some shadows, especially where you have the three pointed arches. We want to make sure that this looks like these doors to the cathedral are pushed back where you're walking through this space. It's not there yet, obviously, but we'll add in some other details to make that a little bit more obvious. So pick and choose what works for you. I just always love the little surprises that come from wet and wet techniques. Now what we want to do is start really carving in some of these darker shadows to create some contrast here. Right now everything is blown out and it looks beautiful because it's dissolving, but we need to see a little bit more of the structure. And this is where what you can do is just mix up a little bit more of your ultramarine with a little bit of your lizard and crimson and a tiny bit of your burnt sienna. And that's going to create more of like an eggplant color. I'm just going to add a little bit more water to this so you can see it on camera. And I'll do a quick swatch of it to show you. So I'm going to add a little bit more burnt sienna to that. I want it a little bit more muted so we can get a darker contrast. There we go. So you see how one is a little bit more on the blue-violet scale, and then this one's more of like a deep violet. So that is what I'm looking for. And you can see here, we're gonna use this as a reference for ourselves to start putting in these shapes. And like I said before, you can pick and choose how you wanna use this. So again, this is where you slow down and you really start looking at these details. And we're still doing this in glazes, so we wanna make sure this is pretty diluted. And you can see here, I just added a little bit more water to it. And I'm gonna go back and forth between using my two round brushes. You can see the larger one has a better point to it than the smaller one. So I'll use that for some of the, these pointed arches and make that a little bit easier to get through. So the best way I think to do this, I'm gonna zoom in really quick so you can see this a little bit better. So I'm just gonna work from top to bottom and make sure that is going in the right direction. So I'm just going to focus on the spots that have the most um, space so then I can slowly tighten up my grip a little bit more as I go. So I can base it around right here where I have that pointed arch and that window. And I'm using this really watered down because I want to see some of that color through there still. 
You can always make it darker with another layer. And if you feel like it's too dark for yours, what you can do is just wipe off your brush on your paper towel and you can always scoop up some of this color so you can see through that a little bit better. So just take your time with it. I'm just quickly mapping these in. There's got a little bit of glaze to it. So you can see right there, the little bit of that yellow is still popping through, which will make it great as a shape for a window. And many of these windows are stained glass or they have a stained glass like appearance to it or shape because this is all Gothic architecture. I'm gonna bump this up so I can see this a little bit better. Hopefully that's less of a gloss for you from my light and from the masking tape. Now we can add a little bit of a shadow here too. We're doing really light marks. Let me zoom on this a little bit more. You can see I'm just adding a tiny bit of that. And I like to just focus on one side so then it gives the illusion of like light shining through. So eventually I'll have one of these to be a little bit darker than the other. And you can easily see where parts of my masking fluid are cutting into that. Oops. And that way I'll be able to clean that up a little bit later. But again, keep it just nice and loose. We're not trying to make this really uh, detailed. Again, it's just about getting that contrast. So next I have this panel right here. I'm gonna zoom out a tiny bit so you can see that better. And this still needs some contrast up here. We can see how it looked with the original where I have this little panel of violet right here. So we'll do a little glaze of that with just the side of my brush. I'm going to have some of it going down into a few sections just to break up that space a little bit. Have a little bit right here. And then you can just keep loading up your brush where you need to. I always like to add a little bit below any sort of ledges where I blocked out some of that with my masking fluid just to give it some illusion of depth. And I'll just do a little bit around here too. So you can see I'm not adding a ton of water to my brush either. I'm almost doing like a dry brush technique in spots just to create a little bit of shadow, but I'm not completely covering over spots. You can just have fun with this. You can see just a little pop of shadow right there is gonna make those little pieces stand out. So I'll just keep working down anywhere where there's a window. And I can even add a little bit of contrast right here too. Just in a few spots if I wanna make some of the windows shine through. And that just gives it a little bit more texture. It gives a little bit more color in those spots. If I wanted to, I can even go in with a little bit of blue just to break up some of that violet and add that to that glaze. And that makes a huge difference. So I'm going back in with the glaze over these windows right here. Same as what we did above here, we can always lighten those up with a little bit of water on our brush. And if you want to lift that up, you can just take your brush and scoop up any of that color and just put that on your paper towel. Just like that. It's starting to come together nicely. Oops. <laughs> Dropping my stuff right now. Right here, I need a little bit of contrast as well. I'm going to go back in with that eggplant color. And just along this top line right here. And then maybe a little bit along the bottom line. So I'm going to add a little bit of water to my brush. And I was running out of that color, so I'm just mixing a little bit more of that. 
just a little bit on the top and bottom. And if some of that scoops out down here, what I can do is just take a little bit of water on my brush, scoop off or wipe off any of the excess, and then I can blend that out with the water that's on my brush just to soften that line. I'm also just going to soften some of the lines right here. I feel like they're a little bit harsh. So just like before, I'm gonna take a little bit of water on my brush, pat off any of the excess, and then I can go in with a little bit of water just to soften that line. Anywhere where you feel like it might be a little too harsh. That looks better. Now on the bottom half, you can see the three portals right here that go into the cathedral. I definitely wanna have a little bit of contrast. So just like before, I'm putting a little bit more emphasis on the right side, just to make it look like there's some sort of shadow. And I'm just using the edge of my brush and just adding more of that eggplant color. Again, this is very watered down because we're just doing glazing. Do a tiny bit on the other side. I'll just have one side that's a little bit less sharp or less wide. And then if I need to soften those lines again, do the same thing. I'm gonna add a little bit of water to my brush, wipe off the excess, and then I can just soften that line. It's just a little bit of scrubbing. Create smooth gradients, really helps to make that stand out. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit just to show you the bottom half of my painting. You can see it's already make a making a huge difference with the contrast there. But I definitely need to make it feel grounded right here. So just like before, I'm gonna put more emphasis on the doorways. And these are huge, if you ever go see these in person, these are quite large, everything is hovering above you. And I wanna do a pretty heavy line towards the bottom just to give it a sense of weight. So just like before, we're using that same eggplant color. This is where you can just pick and choose where you want that to go. Add a little bit more water to my brush. I can break this up a little bit, creating a sense of shadow by just creating some diagonal little marks. And I'll definitely emphasize this more as I get darker with my colors. Make that a little bit more dramatic. Mixing that same color, I just ran out of a little bit of it. So that's already creating a sense of weight. And then once I fill in these little doorways, that's gonna help connect the top to the bottom. Sorry if you can hear the cat. He's been upset that I've been painting all day. <laughs> he gets really sassy. I think that's why he likes to try and destroy my work. Again, you don't need to worry about the precision of this. We're just trying to get the shapes in there. They don't even have to be really straight lines or anything. We're just trying to emphasize the shape. And then I'm also gonna go back in now that this has dried a little bit. And with that same color, I'm just gonna do one more layer. I have to hold my brush kind of weird right now because my hand.
Go a little bit more bold with that. I'm just gonna add a little bit more of a darker color. So adding a little bit more blue and a tiny bit more of my burnt sienna. And I'm just gonna tilt this the other way for a second to do this part and then I'll show you. Okay, so I just went in with that color again. You can see how it's creating some of these harsh lines here. So I'm gonna let that sit for a second. I'm gonna do one more pass with a slightly darker color. So I just added a little bit more blue and a little bit more burnt sienna. So I have to keep moving this around. <laughs> I don't know why this is a harder project today for that. So I can just add in some slightly darker areas and spots. And we're just basing it around the architecture. So you have those guidelines for yourself to help you start carving those out without thinking too hard about it. I know there's like a little triangle pattern right here. So I want to make sure I get that in just because that's a part of the architecture. And then there's two windows on each side. So I'm going to try and get those in. I'm losing some of my original guidelines right now, but that's okay. Close enough. <laughs> but yeah, that contrast does wonders. I love this part. Okay, so now that this has dried down a little bit, I'm just gonna do the same thing that I did before wet my brush, tap off any of the excess, and then I'm just gonna go gently over this line to blur that out. Sometimes I like that harsh line, but for this one, it just feels a little too harsh for that section. And we're just slowly adding more and more contrast with those same colors. So we're doing the exact same thing as we did before using the same colors, we're just making them a little bit more pigmented so add a little bit more blue, a little bit more burnt sienna, and just a tiny bit more of your alizarin crimson. Focusing on one side of your shapes. Create that shadow. Let me zoom in on that so you can see that a little bit better. You can even add a little bit more shadow here in some spots. We're just tapping that into some of these shapes that we've created with our masking fluid. Same thing down here, a little bit more contrast in areas. Okay, some of that might go over that line, that's perfectly fine. I might wanna create some shadow under these little triangle shapes that we have for the pillars. So you can see that a little bit better. So I just went ahead right here, and again, I'm gonna blur that out with a little bit of water on my brush, and then I can scoop off any of that excess color. Blur out any of these hard lines if you want. Sometimes I like leaving it like that though. I think today I want more of like a smoother transition with them. If you feel like some of your stained glass right here is a little off or you wanna change the color, you can add a little bit of alizarin crimson to some of those spots. Make that shine a little bit more. Okay, and we're almost done with glazing this part. This is more of the time consuming part of our painting. So again, we're just gonna keep working our way down. I'm gonna add a few more little shadows here or there on spots of my cathedral, especially since I don't have those lines that I did from my other one. I'm just adding a few little marks of color just so you can see where those pillars are on the sides.
Taking the side of my brush for part of that. I'm gonna add a little bit more contrast here with the blue just on one side. Again, we keep wanting to make that look like it has depth. Oh, that's coming out so nice, yay. And then I'm just gonna add a little bit more contrast again at the bottom half. So blue, alizarin crimson, and burnt sienna, same things we've been using. Sorry if I'm being repetitive. I know sometimes you just run out of the color that you're using. And I'm just going to do a little bit around these doors since this is the, not only is it the lower half of the painting, but it's also covered by these portals right here. So it would be under a pretty heavy shroud of shadow already. And then we can just pull some of that color out in a few spots just to break that up. And that's looking really good. Now if I want to, I can create some of these other little shadows with my brush to create all of the arches inside the archway. I'm just using the tip of my brush and just doing some little lines. Just like that. Not thinking too hard about it. Just gives us that little bit of texture that we need for it. And even these have little stories in them. Usually like in the center part of these types of cathedrals, there's like the last judgment scene in the center. And one of the rose windows is dedicated to the Virgin Mary, all of that. So you can look at all of the detailed photos of the uh, cathedral to give yourself some good inspiration if you really want to get detailed with it. But like I said, this one's mostly for beginners. Even though we're doing some pretty detailed work by just allowing the masking fluid to protect what we're doing. Okay, so I'm gonna go back in with just a little bit of just regular burnt sienna. I'm gonna dilute that with a little bit of water. So just taking some of that on my brush. See, it's a nice vibrant color. And we can just use that in a few spots too. I feel like this is a little bit too violet in areas, so we can just add a little bit of drama with it by adding a tiny bit of that on our brush. We can even include it with part of the doorways so they have more of a, like a a brown color or a burnt umber color. Add some of that to the base and you can see how that just, that little bit of color really affects the way that this looks. And you can have fun with this. You can add it wherever you'd like. Add some of this along part of it here if I want to, just the idea of a shadow. And if it ever looks too heavy, you can just lift it with your paintbrush and a little bit of water. Adding some nice colors there. Do a little bit towards the top too. If you want, you can even go in with some of your cadmium yellow. That's just diluted. Just like what we did in the beginning. And we can do some glazing with that as well. Add some drops of color here or there if you want to really brighten it up. I'm going to do that in a few spots. 
And I can lift up any of it if it's too harsh with just a little bit of my brush and my paper towel. Down here, I definitely think it needs a little bit. Also helps it stand out from the background too. I keep <laughs> moving this around on you, I'm so sorry. This is one that I'm trying to keep lifted while I paint. It's a tricky one. And you can even do a little bit of yellow along the background. Like here, some of my yellow got a little bit lost. So I can go in with just a little swatch of that here or there. And if it feels too heavy, again, just add a little bit of water to my brush. And I can either move that around or scoop some of that up. Because violet and yellow are complementary colors. So a little pop of yellow here or there will just make the rest of your painting stand out. It's a really easy way to make your painting look more interesting and more colorful. And again, I'm just having fun. Dropping in paint wherever I feel like I need to add it. I'm gonna do a little bit of yellow back here too to make it seem like a little bit of glow behind it. A little bit of water. Adds a little bit of warmth to the sky right there. And that's looking really good. You definitely want don't want equal amounts of the complementary colors because basically that's too jarring. <laughs> it, your brain will actually get a headache from it if it's too close uh, in the amount of consistency with the, or I'm sorry, not the amount of consistency, the amount of each color. It's like our brains can't handle it <laughs> without feeling like it's too overwhelming. So that's why I tend to just blur out a little bit of the yellow just to make it look a little bit more subtle and muted. That way the violet in our shadows and in our design really get a chance to stand out. Okay, so I'm gonna add just a little bit more. I forgot a few spots down here with the violet or that eggplant color. Anywhere where I see one of those little figurines, I wanna make sure that they get to stand out by having a darker background with it. So right here, just tapping in some of that color. A little bit around the entryway, since all of these have figurines of different people in them. And that gives it a little bit more drama right there too. And if you look closely, they all have different symbolism associated with them. So all of it's related to Christianity and even some of the kings and queens from prior to Christianity as a way of like connecting paganism to Christianity. It's all sorts of stuff <laughs> that I teach in my classes, but I love it. So yeah, that adds a lot to it. And we can always do another layer with it to it as well. So I'm going to let that sit and dry. And then I will show you how to remove your masking fluid. And then we're going to tie everything together. So we're actually almost done with our painting, if you can believe it. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be right back. All right, we are ready for my favorite step. And that is to remove the masking fluid from our design. Before you start touching it, though, you want to make sure that your paper is completely dry. So go ahead and use a hairdryer or anything to speed up that process because you definitely don't want to be running anything across the surface of your paper that will disturb the fibers. That will dig a hole in your paper or create a texture that you cannot hide. You would basically have to start over again, which is something definitely worth crying about on a bad day. So I like to use several tools. I showed you two of these earlier. This is the kneaded eraser that is great for just removing some of these delicate lines. It's also good for covering a lot of track. Another one is this rubber 
block that's usually used for rubber cement. Sometimes they call it like a frisk eraser. And uh, the only thing with this is it's a little bit harder of a surface, so you wanna be more delicate with it. And you also wanna make sure there's no pigments or anything that are on here that may transfer. So I personally like to use a mixture of the kneaded eraser and one of these click erasers or a white eraser. And these are great where you're just gonna do a slightly tedious and messy job of removing all of the blue or tape, anything that you use to block out those colors. So I'm gonna zoom in on this to show you how much this transforms your painting where you see all of these white highlights. Let me zoom some more because this is fun. And then afterwards, after we remove all of this, I'm going to show you some final glazes that are going to tie all of your colors together. So these are the last little steps that we do to finish our painting. So take your time with this process. Sometimes it's hard to tell if you've got everything, but you'll know immediately if you start painting over it. So if you miss a spot, just let it completely dry before you start trying to remove the masking fluid. Else again, you're going to have the problem of digging a hole in your paper. So I'm gonna do the rest of this off camera just to save time and I will be right back. All right, I am back and I'm so excited with how this turned out. There's a lot of illustrative qualities to this that came out from using the masking marker where you're getting the hint of all these different figures. And let me zoom in on this to show you some of the details. So you can get an understanding of the architecture and how detailed it is, especially with this Gothic style. But we're not having to go through every single detail with a tiny brush to show that in our design, especially like if you're just trying to get the sense of the architecture and just the beauty of the space. And um, there's a few things that are strange about it too. I used this masking marker that I showed you earlier and normally it leaves a nice bright white around anywhere where I used it, but in some spots it left a blue tint to it. So normally I'd be a little bit upset, but it kind of works. It just adds another color to it and it's very subtle. So I'm just gonna go with it. But I wanted to show you that in case you are trying to get some bright whites. Some of these, you know, if they are colored and maybe they stain, but I've never had a problem with that. The only thing is I just bought this new one, so maybe it's just a little bit more pigmented. So I'm gonna zoom out again and show you how we're going to tackle some of the last little bits of glazing. Now with the architecture of this piece, we wanna make sure that not everything is highlighted this bright white, especially if it doesn't make sense for the depth and shape of the space. For example, if this has an archway here, most likely these are archways within them. So this should be back a little ways from here. So I don't mind having some bright whites in areas, but I wanna make sure that it makes sense. Now, one of the easiest things you can do is just to create an overall glaze in spots, just like we did earlier. And what'll happen too is if you wet your brush a little bit, you're going to pick up some of the original color anyway. So it's an easy way, I have a little bit of water on my brush. It's an easy way to clean up any areas where the masking fluid was that didn't work for you. I don't mind any wobbly lines or anything like that. I just think it gives character to the design. You know, I like seeing the artist's hand with their work. But if you are very precise, you might want to go back in and clean up any of these little areas with a tiny brush. You know, we're all different. I think normally I would do that if I had the capability right now because I am a little bit finicky about detail, but with something like this, it sometimes takes away the character of the piece. So you decide how yours looks and what you wanna do with it. So for the glaze, what I wanna do is make sure I have a clean brush. You wanna get some clean water too if you haven't done that already. And I like to just go in with a little bit of my burnt sienna. And we're gonna make this very thin, like a hint of color because when that water hits other parts of your design, you're gonna pick up the colors around it. So you might get a little bit of violet, a little bit of blue, a little bit of yellow. And so I just wanna make sure that I am giving it some character. So right here, that hint of that burnt sienna is just gonna to tone down the white of some of these areas. And I can pick up any of the colors around it just to push that back a tiny bit. 
a little bit more on my brush. And I want some areas to stay white still. So you can choose what your brightest highlights are. But I just like to blur that a little bit so it makes sense. And that's really what glazing is about for a lot of pieces. It's like creating an overall color to make everything look like it's in harmony, which we've already done mostly with our design anyway, but this is just us really looking at these last little things. You can always go back in if you wanna go in with a brighter color. I'm adding a little bit of the same burnt sienna. I'm just adding a little bit more of it on my brush to create this emphasis of this shape right here of the rose window. I have a little bit of that in there. And some artists will just use a big brush and cover the whole thing. But in this case, I think it would be too much and take away all that beautiful work you did. So I'm taking a little bit of burnt sienna just to go over parts of our little figures, our freestanding figures in this part of our architecture. And it's so subtle, it's just a shift of color. But man, does it make a difference. It just ties it together so beautifully. You can have some where they are a little bit brighter than others to give the illusion of it looking aged. I'll zoom in on that so you can see that a little bit more. See how that just slight shift of color makes a difference? Okay. I didn't use that golden ochre at all. <laughs> Probably because I knew it would be too pigmented. So if you did take that out, I'm sorry. Clean up a few spots down here. Again, we're just reactivating that paint around it. And I'll just have parts of it look like it's a little bit brighter. So I'm just keeping a nice loose hand with it. Oh, you can see. Nice loose hand, I'm just tidying up some of these arches. Another fun thing you can do with the arches is if you take a little bit of that burnt sienna, you can go in between some of those lines that you made to create the arches that are running inside these portals. And if I really wanted to add detail, I would have put a little bit of violet in a few of these spots to show these scenes that you would see if you were walking through there. But too bad, it's done now. <laughs> Again, you can pick and choose where you're just picking up a little bit of that burnt sienna color. Definitely down here, because I know inside these portals they are shadowed. So you can just pop that on in a few spots. We're still leaving the white of the paper showing through some parts, so you still get that beautiful glow. And it just makes it look effortless, I think. Go a little bit more dramatic right here since this is the largest one. And if I need to, I can always go back with that eggplant color in a few spots to tidy anything up or add other details. But for right now, I think you get the gist of what this technique is. So I'm just gonna keep working on this, showing you a few other things. And there is a possibility to go too orange with this, so you really just want to keep it light. Oops, that's a big orange spot. See? If that happens, just take a little bit more water on your brush and move that around. Leaving some areas still white. And I'm probably being repetitive, but just reminding you to just stay loose with this. because those details can feel overwhelming sometimes and I don't want you to feel like that. Okay. Adding a little bit more in spots around the top. This is a little bit blown out right here. So I'm going to add a tiny bit of that color in just a few areas. And I'll probably add more shadows there too. That's looking really good. I really love how this turned out. 
I'm going back in with that eggplant color just in a few spots right here. For some reason I didn't get enough shadow in that spot. Okay, but that definitely helps. And what you can always do is if you find that the top or parts of your design are just a little bit too bright, that's where you can decide if you want to create more shadow around it. Let me zoom out to show you what I mean. So at this point, it's hard to tell how everything is looking because we have the yellow of the paper right or the tape right here that's really affecting the way that I'm seeing those colors. So I can use a scrap of my watercolor paper and hold that up against it to see what the true color is. You can see that tones down that yellow quite a bit. And I can also see that some of this is blurring back here. This side looks okay for the side of the architecture, but over here it feels really blown out. And even right here. So sometimes we have to just use our imagination to push these colors forward. And especially with these light yellows and whiter tones, we need to make sure that the surrounding area or that negative shape that we normally use is gonna be a little bit darker. That's gonna create a sense of weight and depth and volume to the architecture since these two towers are massive. And especially down here, just that little hint of shadow does wonders. So don't be afraid to go bold with some of your contrast because that may be the one thing that really works for putting your design together. So this last little bit I wanna show you is an option. Um, it's something that I personally think I need for this design. And there's a few ways to go about it. So especially right here and through part of the edges of the cathedral, it feels just a little bit blown out. And that's just because I didn't have that dark of an outline for my piece when I printed it, which I like because then it looks more like a traditional watercolor painting. So some people use just like a gray or a colored pencil, whatever color you wanna use for it, just to add in a few details around the edges. It's sometimes a little bit easier to control and uh, especially on something like this where you have all these tiny little nooks and crannies. I'm going to do the, uh, the painting method just because I wanna keep it all a watercolor painting instead of mixed media. So I'm going to use the same color, just a really watered down version of that violet color that we had. And I'm only going to put it in a few spots, but especially right here, I can add that. Now, if I really want this to stand out and use like a yellow or even like that burnt sienna color in spots, I can do that. So I'll show you that really quick. And that might be fun to put on parts of the design. So if I just dip into some of my burnt sienna and really water it down, or even this golden ochre, I'll finally use this to show you how this looks. I can just go right around the edge and turn this slightly so it's easier for me to control. And create a little shadow that way. And I'll make that a little bit darker to show you. I'll even include a little bit of blue with it just so we can have a more of a gray color. And that just brings that forward. So it's a really nice subtle change. It's more of a, a grayish brown, just like we mixed earlier. So that's burnt sienna with a little bit of our blue. And I'll do that on both sides of this just to, well, actually that side's okay. I'll do it on this side and some of these little nooks and crannies. And I like to just focus on parts where there's a really sharp angle or something that I wanna emphasize with the architecture. If I go a little too wide like that, I will clean my brush off, wipe it off on my paper towel, and then I will just scrub a little bit of this away, maybe a little bit more water on it. Scrub that away to reactivate it, and that still won't affect the rest of my skyline. That makes a huge difference right there. And that's all you need to do if you wanna emphasize those areas. I just did that in a few of these little marks right here. Actually like that little shape right there, so I'm gonna leave it as it is. 
but anywhere where you feel like you just want to accentuate the architecture and give it a good shape. Add a little bit more right here. And I'm being very soft with this because it's easy to dull out the rest of your painting if you're not careful. And I'll even use that same color down here eventually. I'm gonna finish going around part of the border just to show you how that looks. But on the bottom half of my painting, I'll add a little bit of that to it since I didn't use this color in many places, just to really make this feel like it's weighted right here. Okay, so I'm just gonna do this again where I'm going around those outer edges. I'm just gonna turn my painting upside down for a second so I can see this a little bit easier. And you can always wipe off your brush and then pull up any of that excess color just to blur that out and it just makes such a beautiful shadow. And this side definitely needs it. I lost like a lot of that there. Sorry, I'm <laughs> bumping around things. Blurring that color out a little bit. And it's definitely much better. You can even go more violet with it if you want. And some of these areas towards the top to match more of the skyline. Like that, and that's just a, oh, you can't see that. <laughs> like that where I just have a little bit more blue added to it. And that just makes it look like it's part of that shape. Same as before, I'm just gonna blur out that color with a little bit of water on my brush. and it just dissolves right into the background. And you can obviously go much more dramatic with it if that's more your style. I'm just kind of sticking closely to what I originally did. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of that color on the bottom half. So it's blue with a little bit of our alizarin crimson and a little bit of our burnt sienna. And we wanna go a little bit darker with this than what we already have on the bottom half. And this is where I just pick and choose where I want some of that color to be laid down. And just like what I did with the surrounding part of the architecture, I can Pull some of that color out a little bit. I might actually do a little bit more shadow with this too. This is more from my imagination. There would definitely be more shadows from the, the tower. So I can always add a little bit of that in spots. Kind of spread that out a little bit and that's probably closer to what you would see. But you know, most of this is coming from my imagination and some reference photos, I'm not that good. <laughs> but yeah, I love how this looks. So I hope you liked this and I'd love to hear what you think about the class or if you wanna show off your designs, I would love to see them. I'm gonna quickly dry this because I know some of you like to see the big tape reveal and I will be right back. Okay, now for the big reveal. I hope I don't tear it on camera. <laughs> that would be my luck, right? So usually I always use a hair dryer before I touch this, one to dry the painting and also to activate the glue on the tape. Pull it at an angle and hope for the best. It's looking good. 
All right, here's our final piece with the big reveal. It looks so nice with the tape removed from it with no more masking fluid. There's a few things I'll tweak with it just because I am a little bit of a perfectionist. I see a few things that are bothering me with the bottom half. I'll probably add in a little bit more burnt sienna down here. It looks a little violet and a little bit like it's sitting on top of this. So just a slightly darker color in a burnt sienna or a brown will really tie that together with the shadows. But other than that, I really love how it turned out. It has a nice, like, still structured quality to it. But then when you zoom in, it has all these beautiful little fun details. And if I really wanted to, I can always go back in and even add more colors to it. But for right now, I think it's great for a beginner's piece and something good to practice with if you're doing printouts because it forces you to work with your imagination and reference photos to come up with your own design. But thank you again for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day.